uh, it is the last day, it is day four. It is uh, the second talk this morning in the Blue Saloon. Well, uh, I just realized um, a circle is kind of closing. Um, Manuel is once wrote an email a couple of years ago about, hey, let's get together. Let's do some hacking, programming. How oh, we can have some goulash? It was 22, 25 something-ish years ago. Um, he is, he's an old, we call them entropies. This is uh, the German word Opa, which means granddad. <laughs> and uh, so he's an entropy, an, an old entropia member from Karlsruhe. So it's a circle closes. I'm amazed. Well, um, he lives in, in the States right now, is doing some, he's working, living, and uh, is here for, for the GPN. Um, and he's talking about uh, open source software development and finding new ways of, of doing this, of thinking and kind of culture. Um, and um, yeah, I'm, I'm very, very curious how it goes. Um, yeah, Manuel. Applause for Manuel. Cool. And take us away. Cool, thank you. Um, so the talk, the description, I've been thinking a lot about what I want to talk in this, um, or in this presentation. And it's kind of confusing because I want to talk about everything. Um, I've kind of boiled it down to some pretty tight slides, but I've written a long ranty handout that I will be amending. Uh, in the future, in this one, the handouts have like tons of blog posts I've written about this subject. Like it's all, for me, it's all interconnected. Um, and if there's any area that, I, I'll try to go through the talk fairly quickly to get to a demo hands-on part that maybe is the most suited for a hacker event. Um, so I might go a little bit fast. If I'm going too fast, please tell me. Am I speaking slowly enough? All right. Um, and then all the illustrations, I asked a friend to do all these like beautiful illustrations for the talk. So you can find them on Mastodon. And did you all get the URL for the, for the handouts? It's pretty, it's pretty wild, but it has a lot of links. All right, so here's a couple of links where you can find me. You can find me on Hackaderm. You can find me, my blog is the scapegoat dev blog. Uh, on GitHub, I'm Vazen and I'm Gogo Golems as well. So I like programming and machines. I like all programming languages. Um, well, I don't understand Ruby really, but, <laughs> or maybe Ruby on Rails just put me off. Uh, I really like Common Lisp. I haven't used it professionally or even for hobby in like 10 years, but it influences the way I think. I really like systems. So everything is like things connected and you have to think in the bigger picture and the bigger picture and the bigger picture, uh, which is why reducing things down to a single talk is pretty, pretty hard. Uh, lately, I've really been enjoying large language models. Um, I like making music and drawing, and I like thinking in shapes and forms. And um, Most importantly, especially in my professional work, I really like working with end users. So figuring out how a tool can help end users um, do their job. And I, I work in a small family business, so I end up talking to a lot of people and just like building the software exactly for them. And so a lot of this is influenced by this, uh, by this kind of thinking. All right, so what is this talk about, which is, I don't know. Um, <laughs> so, uh, the first thing is about, I, I call it writing software with a vision. Um, like I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit, um, what's the word, disappointed 
by kind of the software out there. Not that it's it's great, like compared to 20 years ago, the amount of open source software and the quality of it out there is pretty amazing. The communities are great, but I'm missing, it's all bland and the same. So I'll present like how for me, I also had like a moment where I was like, well, it's my software. I can do whatever I want with it. And then started thinking more about this. Um, I have a second part, which is a bunch of tools and techniques that I've developed over the years to just like think more about software and write better software by not writing software or writing a lot of software. Um, and then the last part is going to be like how to regain personal freedom using large language models as a developer, which is uh, I hate the public discourse around this stuff right now because I think it's missing what's actually at least for developers, it <laughs> if that happens again, it's Linux. I've got a backup macOS device just for safety. Um, so I'm, I'm really interested in showing you that part because I think it's something that needs to be shown. It's not something you can really write about that easily. And reading ChatGPT transcripts is just like horrible. Um, but I'll start with uh, software with a vision, and I'll start my timer as well. So the thing that I think happened, and this is might be a little bit US influenced, like I'm not sure what the landscape is in Germany, because I know there's just like a lot more, less commercial thinking in Germany, um, is a, a lot of the open source development that I encounter, usually backed by companies, um, projects are either run by the company pretty much, or they have such a strong influence that everything's kind of tainted by it. A great example, my uh, language of choice being Go right now, is the Go tool chain. The Go tools are all Google, and Google doesn't really care about not Google. Uh, you can see that if you look at like the pages of like some pretty big open source things right now, it's like, it looks like this, and it looks like this. <laughs> They're all the same kind of concept, right? It's like, download a package, and this is this tool, and here's like releases, and here's the GitHub, and um, which, which is great, right? Like this is how you bring a lot of people together, kind of like Java brings a lot of people together in the, <laughs> in the enterprise. But it also kind of pushes you into this way of thinking that this is how you should do open source software, right? Like you have to have a pull request workflow, um, people are going to be like senior engineers or staff engineers and they're going to have like a, you know, an open source evangelist in the company that like makes talks and conferences that are sponsored by companies. Uh, everybody uses like kind of the same languages and frameworks and people argue if like React is better than Vue or whatever, which kind of doesn't really matter, um, especially when you can write your own framework. Um, people argue about best practices, like do you want to have trunk-based development or do you want to have that? But all these practices are designed to work well in a commercial environment. Like it doesn't mean that that's how I should be writing open source. If I write open source and we're like three buddies, like do we want to have trunk? Or do we just have want to have like zip files on the server? Like who, who cares? Um, all the blog posts kind of are the same kind of thing. Either it's like a personal project that has nothing to do with work, except that that's what you do outside of work. Um, <laughs> or you have like, oh, this is what my company's doing, and I'm kind of like the evangelist. And, um, everybody has kind of the same Twitter bios. That might be a little bit more the, the thing in my professional circle in the US. We all attend the same conferences, again, kind of different in the US because there's not much and like com conferences like DEF CON or even Strange Loop are strongly corporate corporate influenced. Um, and so I think there's a much more insidious aspect to that is that it makes us forget what software can be. It's like we think that a software has to be a binary that you can deploy to the cloud to have a config file to, you know, it's it's just like, it reduces everything to something that can be used in a professional workflow instead of saying like, well, software could be like a whole OS with a development environment and that's what we build. Or, um, 
I don't know, it could be a video game that I use to actually build applications in the real world by moving things in the 3D world. Like all of these things don't work in a corporate environment, but they're very viable for smaller groups. And um, it took me a while to realize that when I was writing open source or getting back to writing open source, I was kind of thinking this mindset. Um, I'm actually going through this pretty fast, which is cool. Uh, is this too fast? All right, well, then I'll branch out a little bit because um, uh, this is a good moment to show you um, how I started getting away from this kind of thinking. So when I left my last job, I said, like, oh, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to run a blog and I'm going to create, like, some kind of, like, public persona to get more more jobs and... I decided to write a blog post on this DevTO thing, which is, it's kind of cool because it's really geared towards like beginners and a diverse audience. Um, and I wrote this article here, which, um, which was kind of like collecting all my experience building command line tools over the years at work. And it was, you know, it has like the clickbaity title, um, which works well. And then it had like a bunch of things where I was like, well, to make b good command line tools, there's a bunch of things that, that really make a difference, which is like Python tools don't really work because you have to like set up a VNV and no one wants to do that. Um, while if you just give people a binary, then things are, are great. Um, if you have to look up documentation somewhere else, like why not make it part of the tool where you can just like query the tool to get all the documentation you need. Um, having examples, like all of these things, I wrote them up, right? Like, it's, like this is, it's a, it's a blog post that has a lot of thinking behind it because it's like 20 years of building these things. But I was writing it clearly towards like an audience that is interested in getting jobs or building better tools at their work, like these kinds of, this kind of thinking, or even the concept of like, command line tools is already like kind of tainted. So I wrote this blog post that was in May, took a sabbatical over the summer where I went to the Recurse Center and thought some more about this. Um, mostly about like the technical side of things and then in, in October I just like started building it. Um, I started building a library that was it's called Glazed which kind of builds all these things, like it has a help system and it has like examples in the help and it looks pretty, it has like structured data output and it has like all these features and all these flags and it's a great library, you can just uh, drop it into your project and use it. It has like a readme and it has like pull requests and issues and like all this stuff. And, you know, I left it there. It was like, I did what I wanted to do, I have like here it starts to get messy, but um, <laughs> I'll get to that later. So I built this library, and it was like you know it was very much in the in the the thing that I was lamenting about. It's like very like it has releases and it has like binaries you can download, like all this stuff. And then I started building tools using it, and I started realizing like actually the power is in the tools you build with it, and the reason all these flags and command line tools are important is because they are for the user, and the user in this case being like the developer, the person using these things. So I started thinking more about these aspects and then realized like I had a bunch of tools together. They started getting like weirder and weirder and <laughs> Flow in here remembers all the weird stuff we used to do. <laughs> um, and, then I, and then I realized, you know, um, I had this, uh, where can you do it? Like, have, I, I've built all these like little tools because Go is really like a productive language. You can just like bang stuff out. And um, so I had to do a lot of accounting at work and I built this tool called Skeleton, which allows you to just like query things and get them as, tem uh, you know, as, as like templated data. And I had a funny logo for it, which was starting to be like, you know, I'm starting to, to find my sense of humor back. And then I realized I can actually literally do what I want with this software, and I created this organization called the GoGo -Go Golems that, um, you know, built software for the, for, for the better humanity. So I started writing documentation upper caps because I like, you know, I, I like caps lock. 
and then I started making like little logo, uh, little slogans for these for these GoGo golems. Um, I started writing. Still have to finish that. Like all the documentation, that was some kind of like obscure manual that was found. Um, but the tools themselves are like very. It's stuff I need for work. It's like doing accounting and creating Excel tables. Um, but I realized like there's no reason why I can't just like invent a whole world around it of why these these little creatures, the Google golems, like write code and build applications. And that kind of, not only it became really fun and it can use like all these weird AI tools to build a little world around it, um, but it actually made me write better software. It just gave me a lot of ideas of what I can build, um, how I build it, how they all integrate together, like, because there's a big concept behind it. Um, so the talk was originally just going to be about like you know how these things work. Um, I don't think this is actually that interesting. But if you like Go, if you like command line tools, I'm pretty proud of at least the concepts. I also it's a little bit cryptic because I realize I don't want anybody to contribute, <laughs> at least for now. <laughs> they're great to use though. They're like really they're really useful, especially like skeleton. And excuse me, in Geppetto, there are ways to build applications by just sharing YAML files. So it's really easy to turn um, to turn little little YAML files into into whole programs. And for example, just to show you um, an example, so Geppetto is my GPT wrapper, and then Geppetto has a command line tool that's called Pinocchio that you can use to talk to GPT because GPT, you know, makes stuff up. Um, and for example, to generate these little slogans, I made an app that's called Chant2, which looks like this. So it describes a bunch of command line flags. It has a bunch of settings for OpenAI. It has a name that's called, it has a flag that's called body. Geppetto is not that, that interesting as a framework. And then it has the prompt at the beginning. It has the prompt in here, which is just a template, right? Um, if you've done some prompt engineering, this stuff is just like weird as hell. <laughs> I'll get more into into prompt engineering and how this like all fits together. This is a very early prompt that I did, so it's probably not that great. But what you can do when you call Pinocchio, right? It has like all this rich help system here that tells you uh, it has like tutorials and applications and examples. And if I now call Pinocchio mine. Go go! I get the list of all basically these YAML files in here. So it's reloaded. You know, we we share it with my colleague, so we have the same applications always. And then if you um, call this thing with um, someone, tell me a sentence that will turn into into little slogans. I'll just make stuff up. Make stuff up. <laughs> I don't know if uppercase prompts are that great, actually. Um, this all kind of matters. So, you know, I just put this in. It's like my little command line tool. And then... Um, <laughs> so you can build little things like that. Um, so this is kind of fun, but I actually have a bunch of really useful prompts for work where you say like, you know, given this description, just generate like SEO titles because no one wants to do SEO titles. Um, I have a bunch of stuff which, uh, yeah, I'll get, I'll get more into this. Like you, you can, you can build some really useful stuff like ZSH YAML. It's basically you can pipe your, your bash history into it and like say, or like not your bash history, but the content of your terminal window. And it will just like say what you should type in. So you can just like type I don't know, mirror the display, and then it will just like complete it, which is um, it's pretty cool. Actually, does this work? The cool thing about language model programming is you can just, as you talk, just type these things in. I don't remember how it works, so I'm going to use the, the help system. And it just has request. So I guess. Mine zsh request is that an argument? Yeah, 
mirror the display using X render. And then it will just like give me a list of possible completions. Um, it's it's supposed to like take the whole thing, so I will always like add a, a couple of boring like uh, if it has no context, it will just like add some boring commands. But um, you know this this is pretty useful. You can pipe it through uh, through a little menu thing. Um, I don't have this set up on Linux, but anyway. Um, so going back, you know, this all kind of derived from this, like, I wrote a blog post that's kind of boring, has a clickbait title to suddenly building a whole world of little tools and then, you know, starting like building little YAMLs for everything and then realizing, because I picture this as like all these like little golem workers that build unfinished apps, I build a lot of unfinished apps, um, which has, <laughs> which, um, has really gotten pretty Excuse me is one for Elasticsearch, because Elasticsearch querying drives me absolutely bonkers. Uh, Oak is the one I'm most interested in, which uh, actually wraps TreeSitter, the grammar generator, and you can formulate queries as YAML files that say, for example, like, give me all the class names in my code repo, and then it just like outputs them, which is, which is great for like prompt engineering, for example. So going back to the talk, uh, this was me breaking away from this stuff, right? Like it's, uh, it's I can write the software that I want, I can write it the way I want, and if it's the way I want to think about software, then that's how I should do it, because it will lead to better software for me. Um, there's a bunch of other insidious things um, that comp company priorities do, which is because they're so involved in developing what creates our infrastructure ultimately, the Linux kernel, like, um, you know, like deployment architectures, Kubernetes, all of these things, companies are interested in putting in the features that they need to run their business, which is usually automating the workflow for a lot of contributors instead of actually building software for users. So this gives us, you know, like a lot of boilerplate because every company wants to have every option in the software to, to do things. Uh, there's like complex architectures, there's like some pretty arcane and like vendor specific deployment practices where it's like, oh, here's the AWS stack and like this is built for Lambda thing and like all these kinds of things. Um, React, as much as I love React, kind of has the same things as well, which is like there's so many commercial companies using it, that old tooling around it is, uh, for example, things that I, that I really enjoy, like Storybook and Chromatic, are really just like built for the sake of automating a workflow using freelancers and stuff like that. Uh, poor infuriating documentation, that's uh, really true for the Go tooling, drives me absolutely nuts. Um, but that's because Google doesn't care, like they don't want to spend a developer building like really nice documentation if they already know how it works. And then um, all of this leads basically, you as a developer, even if you build open source, you have to like learn and remember and then discard all this like knowledge that no one cares about. Like I don't really care about OAuth, um, you know, <laughs> all the details of OAuth and how to click a thing in the Google console to get my app running, like I don't care, don't want to remember that. Um, so this leads us to like gluing all these APIs together that are given to us by companies is um, pretty much mindless work. It's really exacting work, like it's really tiring to do that. You can't just like, you know, just like, you can just like slap it on the table. If you make a common mistake, all your app crashes. And the, the effect of that is that it leads to burnout, right? Like if you have to do boilerplate all time under pressure and we don't get anything for it. It's um, that's a, a sure way for burnout. And the bigger trap is like it hinders you to think about the software that you write. Like if you're in deep in the details of like the Terraform documentation for some kind of like AWS resource, you're not thinking about your user. You're like, why, why the heck do I have to like set deploy type Fargate? Like all this, all this noise. Um, and that's the trap that I fell into for a lot of time where it's like so focused on like integrating things to make them work really smoothly that I didn't realize that 
you know, if you think about the user first, there's a lot of shortcuts, for example, you can do, or there's like a whole different world of software you can build. So it doesn't have to be this way. And the way I started doing this, and this is something I developed over the last year, but also kind of reconnect with my past at Entropia, for example, or inside the Kairos Computer Club is like thinking about the big picture. It's like, why do I write software and for whom? And if I consider myself as kind of an artist writing code, like what's my legacy going to be? Is it going to be like an AWS glue shell script? Like you look at this in 20 years and you're like, cool. <laughs> Uh, or is it going to be like, you know, the Google Golems organization, even if the tools don't mean anything anymore, at least there's something there that tells something about what I do and what I cared about. So I think those questions are like worth asking yourself. Like there's no real, res there's no real answer. It's going to change all the time. But I think just asking these helps you, um, well, be more content with life, but also write better software. Um, I'm going to skip the centering the user part, which is about, like, I, I haven't put the thought that I think it needs, um, but basically talk to your users and check your programmer brain in. Like, it's easy to listen to users and, like, picture the system that's going to implement the stuff that the user's talking about, but that's actually not what's important. What's important is actually making it so that the user has control and fun with the work that they do. And they're just as much caught in the trap of being shaped by the technology they use than you are building the technology they use. Uh, so I have a lot of things to, to say about that, but I, I, I think there's a bunch of things in the handout. I've written quite a few blog posts about it. Um, but really, I think the best thing you can do as a developer is just like try to listen realize that um, often doing software halfway is maybe the best thing you can do. Like there's a lot of things where manual work to complete the technical workflow is actually what brings joy and control to users. Because there's, especially in like logistics or like retail, there's going to be so much fuzziness at the edges that if I encode this as a form, suddenly all this fuzziness disappears and people just like bang their head and then they're just going to go back to putting post-its on the display and make errors, which is frustrating as well. So, you know, technologies in a vacuum is neutral, but as soon as you build technology for people, you have to think about why you're doing it. Are you constraining their world or are you like expanding it? Um, all right, he here's... How much time do I have left? Because I really want to get to the large language models. All right, cool. So, so here's, um, this is just like tools that I've developed over the last 20 years that now have kind of, for me, come together to really allow me to quickly get to interest, interesting spaces uh, when thinking, especially about software. Um, there's a bunch more details in here. Uh, I've written about some of it on the blog as well, if you... Um, if you want to get deeper into it. And those are very personal, right? Like they kind of work for me. This is not, I'm not telling you like you should do this. It's just like showing how people work and the stuff that they don't show the world is for me one of the very interesting things. Like it's easy to look at the results and say, this is amazing. Uh, I think it's even more interesting to see how people build these amazing things. Um, so I've been keeping a lot of sketchbooks. This is from my last sketchbook, and it's like a big, crazy, chaotic mess, and I don't know how I can zoom into this. Uh, oh my god. Linux, help me. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, anyway, I've, I've, I've learned drawing a while ago, and I've like put a lot of effort into bettering my handwriting and just like being able to do clean diagrams, because it like suddenly turns your notes into something that people want to use and that you want to look at back instead of like scribbling it on you know a little piece of paper. Um, and then this allows me to, what I do is I just like layer my notes. So this page has, it started with the drawing and then I started like looking for space to put notes about software that I was writing. And then I started like doodling during a Zoom call on the left. And then I added like 
arrows on top of what I had written before, and then I went back in with watercolors and put titles on it, and like it just builds over time. But all these ideas that I put in kind of germinate. So I don't know. It's it's something I really like because it allows me to, you know, even the drawing kind of looks like maybe something that's not that relevant to software building, but actually it's the it's the logo for my tool called Cleopatra, which is like a unit testing tool for command line tools, like the most boring stuff. But now, to me, it's connected to this image. So, you know, doing like golden testing of command line tools, which is just capturing the output and diffing it, is now, for me, part of a whole ecosystem linked with like tons of ideas. So I got a lot of value out of that. Uh, I have a couple of tricks. I use very small sketchbooks, um, you know, 40 pages or 60 or so, because then I can finish them quickly. And it's like, oh, yeah, I've made 100 sketchbooks. Um, but they're all very small. Um, it helps me. Like, I like drawing software. Like, I think in shapes and forms, I think. Uh, I think in systems. And so a lot of my software writing is actually just drawing things out and then one day I'll just like sit down and write it and then it kind of works. Which doesn't work in a corporate environment because everybody thinks you're just like a slacker doing menial stuff because it always works. Um, took me a while to realize that. Can't do that. Have to pretend you're doing a lot of very hard stuff. Uh, <laughs> It, um, one thing is like I'm not precious about my sketchbooks like if I spill water on it or like if I go in with a marker or like all if I rip off a page I don't care uh, that's not that's not the important part um, there's a downside to sketchbooks at least for me is that it's really hard to search in them so whatever I write in them I'll usually like not reuse in the future if I don't put it into digital and putting it into digital is a lot of work like I can't just like snap a picture and put it in um, I actually have to go over and like figure out like what the heck did you even write here or like what is this, uh, and then transform it into notes that I can uh, that I can use. So that's kind of the the next part. This is something I've developed over the last two three years when I started writing, um, and I use this methodology called Zettelkasten, which for German speakers is like what? <laughs> Everybody has a Zettelkasten, um, but it has like. I'm using it in like the English influencer kind of uh, kind of way. There's a, a German like sociologist who, because he didn't have a computer, like started doing like hyperlinks and tree structures on paper using some super clever notation thing. Um, but the core idea is that when you have uh, when you have ideas like fruitful ideas or concepts, uh, you put them into atomic notes that you can then link. Um, so the little thoughts that you formulate, you can like start cross-linking them, and then over time they build, and the more you link them, the more you get like interesting callbacks to a really interesting shower thought you had three years ago, and then you realize, oh, this connects to this. Um, this re works really well for me, because I'm just like... <laughs> um, and I think one thing I've, I've, I've seen people do is like they get lost into the details of the system. I, I just started writing markdown files and then one day I had too many markdown files and I was like, oh, maybe I should like start organizing them a little bit better. So what I do is just like optimize for fun. As long as it's fun, the workflow is fine, right? Like um, it's when it starts to not be fun that maybe a better organizing system is, is needed. So if, if you look, I've linked my vault. It looks like very kind of complicated workflow stuff, and there's like old parts. Uh, this has all grown over time. Like I didn't sit down and devise like a crazy numbering system or so. It's just like one day I had too many. It was like, got to do something about it. And the last part, I think this I learned through drawing and music more so than software is like it's dedicating some time to practice and thinking in this case for example so every every saturday i go to the coffee shop and i i do all this weird stuff but it's it's not i'm not looking for results it's just like time that i reserve to do this stuff uh, i don't need to act on any of these ideas that i have i don't need to like limit myself to the current project is that i just sit down and do whatever and if i'm not inspired i can i what i like doing is just like putting up some stupid react tutorial on youtube and like copying it 
because at least I'm, you know, maybe I'll pick something up. Like maybe I'll have some inspiration. In the worst case, I just like watch YouTube for a morning, learn some some IDE shortcuts or something. Um, and so I, I call it creative practice because that's like a pretty common word in, in the art world. Um, oh, here's a couple of more things. Uh, reading is great. Uh, not reading books is even greater. Like uh, having just like a ton of books ready on your bookshelf for when you need it and you just read the table of contents. Pretty nice. <laughs> I'm actually serious. Like, like I can buy a book about eBPF and I can read it from beginning to end and then like in two months it's just like as if I had just read the table of contents so that like there's no point in reading the book anyway. It's actually worse because I'll just have wasted two months of my life on something that's deprecated now. Um, so having a lot of books that you haven't read or like there's so many ways of reading a book that I, I wrote, wrote a blog post about it um, that anytime you can snag up a book that looks like high quality enough just get it you can always you know, um, look at them beforehand. Uh, laser printer and ring binder is like my the the mice because um, I print out I don't know hundreds of pages a week and don't read them. <laughs> I read some of them, and so um, I'm going to skip writing because there's so much writing on the internet. Uh, so this is the workflow. I'm going to skip that as well. Like optimize for fun, I think is the is the one important thing. Like if you're having fun doing something creative, then just continue doing it because you're having fun. Um, and this routine thing, like doing it every week, things build up way quicker than you think they would. Like if you just do an hour of note taking a week, in four months you'll have like a huge stack of notes, and you like you <laughs> you just like oh how how did this happen? Like now. And and you can really live a long time on these notes. Like I'm still digesting notes that I took during a month in the summer last year. Like this is where this all still derives from. All right, and now the cool part. We just like at 30 minutes, but at what time is it exactly? 22. All right, so questions are going to be in 10 minutes-ish, right? If we want to have 15 minutes of questions. All right, cool. I'll show you a few things. Um, why large language models, about which you hear so much weird stuff um, out there, are really, really cool for programmers. And so mathematically, like one, one thing I really criticize OpenAI about, for example, is that no one explains to people what these things kind of really do and like have like examples and you know, exercise and all that stuff. Uh, but really, a large language model just like computes the probability for every word that exists, given a context. Um, so already, ChatGPT or even J GPT API like really, really restrains what a language model does because they only give you a couple of tokens based on probability. You you can't like sample for every token, which is interesting in some cases. But that's all a language model does, and um, you know they've all been trained on like predicting the next token, which is also like a decision. And it's kind of amazing that you know this kind of stuff comes out of such a simple formulation and such a simple training method. I'm I'm not going to go into too much detail, but and because it's language, people kind of want to see in these models what they want to see, and it's really hard to convince people otherwise. Uh, because it applies to me, right? Like, I only see in these things what I want to see. Um, one thing that really annoys me, though, is when people call it intelligence, because, um, like, not only are these things just, like, numbers on my GPU, which, you know, uh, Fortnite does as well, <laughs> but they don't reason well anyway. Like, they kind of suck at doing any kind of, like, the things that people pretend they can. It just doesn't work that well. Um, I like the definition of Seymour paper, which I've, uh, which I've read. I'm actually going to just like pass a few books around just so you can see how I take notes in, in books. Um, but there's a quote I found where uh, he says that, you know, AI as a field is uh, basically concerned with augmenting machines to do things that if a human were to do them, it would be considered intelligent, but doesn't mean that the computer is intelligent. Um, so, you know, back in the days, everybody was amazed that a computer could play chess, because chess was like, 
this the pinnacle of human intelligence? It still is. Like chess players are just as intelligent as they used to be, but no one thinks the computer is intelligent. It's just like, oh, now they can play. They can play chess. Who cares? Uh, so I think this is kind of happening with language models right now, but it's so mesmerizing because it's language. Like we can read into it whatever we want to read. Um, I'm going to not be able to do a demo if I continue doing this. Uh, but my mental model is basically they're like kind of probabilistic macro engines with packages. So you can like write some kind of macro call and then it will expand it using whatever has been trained on and adapt it to the shape of the context you want to give it. So the grammar of the question doesn't really matter. You can write some Python code and then you can just say write it in JavaScript and it will generate JavaScript that matches whatever you asked it. Um, and the way I think of that is it's kind of like spatial compression. So I call it spatial because there's regions you can explore. So if your prompt goes into a region, it doesn't really matter if it's like Python syntax or JavaScript. If I want to know about futures and promises, that's kind of a region in space. And it's a compressed context that I will then uncompress into Go, for example. Um, I've linked a bunch of videos where I just like mess with stuff to see how far you can go, how small you can make prompts. And um, all right, but so what do I think is really great about large language models that they eliminate this assembly line work that gluing APIs kind of requires? Is like they're really good, especially if you like prompt them in context. They're like, look, this is my API. This is what I want to do. Just like do it. And if it's boring transformations, like boring macro expansions, they do really well. Um, and the best way to play with that is just like make up APIs, like stuff that definitely doesn't has, hasn't seen in training. Um, and let me, so I've stopped using the, how do I make the font bigger? Oh my God, Linux. I have to be in this, ah. I've started using Emacs again after 10, 15 years. Um, so I use org mode with org AI because it's just like more relaxing. Uh, I've got a couple of prompts in here. Um, you can set the system prompt. So this is, for example, my Go system prompt. You just say like, use these libraries, use this stuff. Like, uh, um, anybody has an idea? Do, do, do you guys have like, a, say, a, a sensor or like some kind of like shitty API that you've been dealing with? No. All right, uh, like a website with an API? I don't know. Um, should have prepared that. Uh, LM58 temperature sensor? Is that a temperature sensor? All right, let's... Yeah, or let's just take something like this. So like, let's look at some kind of like uh, protocol. What is this? Device functional modes? Oh, was there I squared C no, commands? It's, it's uh, where's the register map? Uh, this doesn't look great. I should have prepared uh, that. Yeah, let's do that. It was LM75. All right, let's look at the data sheet for this one. Um, and where's the data sheet? Yes, there. All right, cool. Specifications, blah, blah, blah. Device functional mode, register map. So, so, right, so this is horrible. This is what you do when you do embedded engineering. It's just like you do implementing that stuff all the fucking time. It's just like mem copy and complicated. Um, this is not really interesting, is it? Um, but I'm going to do it anyway. So I want to write an API for this, right? Uh, I really don't. Oh my god, copy, paste, and PDF is always. All right, so I'm just going to be like, look, I want an API for this. So I'm going to go write an API for this. And then I just say, like, please write me an API for this. Right? And so while I'm doing this, I'm actually not in this like exacting mode where I can't think, where I'm just like looking, what is byte 15 on this register or whatever? It's just going to do stuff 
which is actually very consistent and pretty clean because it has seen a lot of clean and consistent APIs and it's trained to be consistent to itself and it will generate this and I'm going to go either continue drawing on my, on my breadboard, on my whiteboard or just like looking at other temperature sensors and stuff while it's like building this. It has seen like I2C in the past, like all this stuff is pretty, it's pretty, I don't know if I2C bus exists or not, but I can write it like I'm an engineer. Uh, I don't care if it's like register three or four because I can look it up. Um, but this keeps me in the brainstormy kind of mode and uh, I'm going to interrupt it here. But the next step you can do that again saves a lot of time is like write a CLI tool to query the LM75 using that API. And I'm like, you know, writing a little tool to play with my sensors. It's like, yeah, sure, I'll do that. It even uses, you know, the flag library that I told it to use. We'll do all that stuff. Uh, you can refactor it using these things. You're like, oh, well, can you, you know, make a flag for the, for the device address? Um, so this is where your knowledge as an engineer comes in because, you, you know, you, you, you know you want to have a flag to do stuff. Um, so you can do add command line flags for dev, add, and bus num. And, that, and, you know, in polishing this a little bit, like, that's actually fun to do as a developer. So at some point, I just stop and be like, okay, well, this is enough boilerplate. Now I want to have some, some hands on the keyboard time. Um, I, I think this is amazing. Um, you can go even further. We can be like, write a web application that pulls the temperature over web sockets and displays a graph. So here, prompt engineering starts to be a little bit more important. Like you want to give it some libraries, maybe some APIs that you should use instead of just like fetching stuff that might be out of date or doesn't exist. Um, if an API doesn't exist, I actually like it because it usually means like maybe you should write that API because it looks pretty good. Um, and so probably with some bit of thinking, you know, in an afternoon of work, drinking coffee and doing some messing around with my, with my colleagues, I'll actually have a command line tool, a library, an API, a web graph, web socket thingy, uh, some nicely written documentation and I have, I'm not even tired in the evening, right? It's like, it's done. So this to me is like the liberating aspects of it. It's like any kind of API, I don't even go to the documentation anymore, I just like record it in Chrome and then I paste the Chrome login there. And so like build an API and it works like, in an afternoon I built like APIs for archive.org and like all these like paper sites, even if they don't have APIs, it's just like record it in Chrome. Um, I wrote a proxy for ChatGPT uh, by recording ChatGPT, asking it to write the ChatGPT proxy, <laughs> which was pretty funny as well. So that one I haven't put up in open source because I don't want to get a takedown take request, but that was pretty funny. Um, all right, so there's so much more that I want to show about large language models, but I hope that that showed you a little bit what, what's like what's possible for developers where, where they're great. Like I don't care that this stuff doesn't exist or doesn't work right off the bat. Like I want just the boilerplate. Um, and if you prompt it in context with the right APIs for which I wrote Oak, right, to have it like concise and fast and updating, then you usually get really good results because nothing about this involves any reasoning. It's just like macro expansion. All right. Um, so I had a final part about all of this, but I, the message here is that all these things that previously you wouldn't build on your own just because you have to interface with the world of like corporate software, you know, and you don't want to on a Saturday, you don't want to like read sheets and be like, why is byte 16 like this thing or why, like, I don't, which, what's the graph library JavaScript interface? Like, I don't care. Uh, now you can spend your Saturday morning building a whole home, home automation graph system and just be like, cool, it works. And the next time an API comes out, you just be like, can you update this for this API? And just like paste a PDF in there. Um, and that allows you to basically build your own vision without being blocked by, um, by the vision of companies. Uh, I think I'm going to stop here. Let, let me go back to the slides. Maybe I have something cool that I forgot about. 
and then I'll open it up for, for questions. Uh, yeah, so I think for me, the most important is like I'm not tired in the evening, and when I want to do open source, I know that within an hour, I can actually really knock some stuff out. Like I can make an archive API in an hour and then just go get dinner. Um, and very important, like there used to be this concern, like only OpenAI has the money to train them once the Facebook models leaked. This has been pretty much proven wrong. I've tried a little bit of these models and they are able to do this macro expansion pretty well. Like, I don't care if they can reverse every third word or every fourth or, you know, pass the bar exam. I don't care. <laughs> Just expand my PDF. Um, all right, there, there's a bunch more. But, um, you know, this is uh, basically the conclusion here. I'll continue updating the handouts. I'll probably, like, do a couple of, like, follow-up talks where I actually talk about the Google Golems ecosystem. Um, then some more hands-on LLM shenanigans. There, there's a bunch of videos that are pretty cool in there. I, I wrote, while eating breakfast, I wrote, like, a Go stack trace handler that explains why you crashed and tells you how to fix it which actually works really, really well. Um, there's a video on how I build it in there. Uh -huh. And the last part, which is dear to my heart, is like logistics and accounting software is actually really, really cool um, and is really, really subversive, actually. But that will be for another day. And uh, that's it. I I'm blown away. Seriously, it, it's super inspiring and gave me so many ideas. Um, oh. my, my brain is constantly working on, on ideas. We have roughly 10 minutes Q&A. Um, I hope you have a lot of questions. There are not many people, but I have, hope you have some questions. Yes. Um. I once read a blog post called The Moral Economy of Gophers, where someone argued that um, Go is so mechanical and so repetitive that developers aren't able to express any sort of style. But um, I wanted to ask you, what do you think of it? Because it, all, because it really makes sense to automate this using ChatGPT uh, or stuff like that, if it's so mechanical. Uh, I think Go works really well with these tools because it is so annoyingly boring. Um, so I don't know if you use Copilot uh, for writing Go, but you know it's it's like I type error return and then if and then it just like generates the error message, which you know it's so so I can just like type complete and actually get like nice error messages that match my error message style. Um, I don't know how to change the size on this. I don't know if it's good to to expand it, but like the, the structure and also the fact that the tooling is so opinionated, like there's one way to do fuzz testing, there's one way to do unit testing, there's one way to do command line tools, kind of. Uh, works really well because your training corpus is very consistent. So so unit tests, so, so the approach I do, and there's like a lot to be said about prompt engineering, but I write an API. Uh, API's interface is very like, there's one way to do it and that's it. There's one way to do context and cancellation. There's one way to do concurrency. So it, re it, it is really good at just like writing idiomatic code. If you try something like, uh, what's a language that's all over the place, Python. I, Python will just like be, one time we'll do async like this and then we'll do async like that. And I'll use like a 10 year old library followed by like the modern stuff. Uh, Go actually works great for, for for just generating boilerplate, right? And it was conceived to have, in a big company, people write consistent thing, except now I have my own company that writes my Go code for me. <laughs> like, that, that, that's the way I think about it, is like, all this like AI stuff right now is actually giving individuals the power of a whole corporate tool workflow and resources, right? Like like even for artists, now they can say like generate me a thousand thumbnails of the of this asset for my video game and they don't need the resources of a whole asset drawing team to do that. And then the people who have to spend their time drawing like a thousand swords just to get them dismissed. Um, they're now free to do their own video games. So uh, that's my utopian view of all of this, and it applies to developers in, in exactly the same way. 
Did that answer your question? Um, oh, it's great to do this as well. Uh, like, I want documentation for this. Come on, yeah. And usually it's good, right? <laughs> um, so now all my all my software usually has some some decent, at least consistent documentation. Uh, and if I want to update, right? Like if I update the API, I just do this, and I say, like, "Well, please generate it again." And I was like, "Okay." <laughs> Um, when my internet goes down and I like I have this like delay where I'm just like wait 200 millisecond and press tab like that's gone I'm like oh I really have to do this myself um, any other question yeah. I have the feeling you fried some brains <laughs> <laughs> I hope it wasn't oh man I broke everything in here but this means um, that I, as a hardware developer, who has basically no idea, this LM75 thing, my, a huge click. Yeah, and it's, you have to see it to be like, oh, okay. That's yeah, and I'm, I'm a hardware developer. I love my, my ultimate designer. It's a an hate and love relationship. Um, but now I have a way... Ooh, it, it, it's easier for me to to interact with the with the with the electronics, with the with the microcontroller, or with a sensor, whatever, without me n having to know how to write C or C plus plus or whatever, and, and makes it easier. Uh, so so things you know, I, especially like if you use Altium and you you work like in an embedded corporate kind of structure. Uh, th things you can do as well, which works really well, is like everything that's kind of like DSL. I, I think of them as like domain-specific languages, right? It's like uh, uh, export this as JSON, and you can prompt it with your JSON schema, and then y y you know if 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 part of your tooling is to just like generate documentation and stuff like that, you can you can basically take all your disparate vendor data sheets and say like, well, please put it in two-hour format, or like generate like an Altium you know library yeah. library generation automatic yeah. so so <laughs> th think about like macro expansion everything that's structured language you can either expand or contract uh, and transform so that stuff works really well and if i had prompted it with a json schema i would probably have generated the right thing and if it's like slightly off then i don't care i can fix it um right and then uh I don't know. There's just play with this like language transformation thing. Instead of asking it to do things, you just like ask it to to transform language. Basically, um, is where it's really effective. Some questions. Still, Brian Fry. I have one last thing to show, and then maybe we can we can close. Just I, yes. I thought about it. So w w one thing that um, th models do really well, right? Like I could paste a bunch of data in here, a bunch of numbers, and then say like, um, you know, ask a questions like, what's the operating range of the sensor, and then just paste it in, and like paste it in. And then more often than not, it will just like return nonsense because that's not stuff it has seen. Like especially if it requires some reasoning of like knowing what's an operating range, where can I find it, what does it mean? It will like find a temperature and was like, oh, it, this dude asked for a temperature, so I'm just going to output a temperature that I've seen. And it's like it has, like it's wrong. It's it's like not what you want. It's dangerous because it looks plausible. Um, so this kind of like I don't know if this is true or not. Um, it might be true because it just has seen that sensor way more often. But the better way to do this is instead of asking it a question, right, that has an answer. What you can do is you can transform this to JSON. No, create a JSON, create a struct to represent this, and write a program that computes the operating range. Um, and so. That it actually can do because it's just like language transformation, right? It's like a table, and then you have to look at the third column, and then you look at the range. So now you have a program that's deterministic that you can debug, you can turn into a tool that actually gives you not just the answer for the question you ask, but the answer for every follow up question. And now you can put all your data sheets in there, export them as JSON, and say, like, give me the operating temperature as a JSON, as a command line tool with a web interface. And then you go home and you, you know, 
work on your open source. Calculate or write a program to calculate the uh, DC DC converter that has a maximum output ripple of 10 millivolts and a precision of and this and that and want to have 10 amps. This kind of stuff. And if the formula is wrong, you know, it's fun to fix the formula. Yeah. It's the stuff around it that you don't care about. So, yeah, so ask it to write the program to solve your problem is usually much, much better than asking it to solve a problem. Yes. I think this is a good, this is a good, this is a perfect conclusion. And this is a perfect final sentence. Cool. And there's a talk where someone actually has negative takes on language models. So let's, let's go see what that is about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Applause. Manuel, thank you very much. Um, You're welcome. I'm inspired. Um, good to have you here. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for coming on a Sunday, on a Sunday morning.